From the dawn of civilization, humanity has sought connection with the divine. Across the globe, ancient cultures performed rituals that may seem bizarre to us today. But what were these rituals? And why did ancient people believe their gods demanded such strange acts? Today we're exploring the most bizarre rituals of ancient civilizations. So, let's embark on this mystical journey together. In every corner of the ancient world, people believed that gods and supernatural forces influenced their lives. To gain favor or avert disaster, they engaged in rituals that, to the modern eye, can seem bewildering. The Egyptian Animal Mummification In ancient Egypt, animals were not just companions or sources of food. They were sacred beings, believed to be the physical manifestations of gods. The practice of animal mummification, which began around 3000 BCE, was an integral part of Egyptian religious life, reflecting the deep connection between deities and their animal avatars. Let's take the cat. Revered as the embodiment of Bastet, the goddess of home, fertility, and protection. When a sacred cat died, it received a funeral ceremony akin to that of a high-ranking official. The mummification process was meticulous, intended to prepare the animal's soul for the afterlife. The process began with the removal of the internal organs, which were then treated and preserved separately. The body was dehydrated using natron salts, a method that prevented decay and ensured the body's preservation. Following this, the body was wrapped in linen, sometimes adorned with jewels or amulets, and placed in a specially crafted sarcophagus. Many animal mummies were buried in vast catacombs, designed specifically for different species. The discovery of the catacombs of Anubis, for example, revealed over 8 million dog mummies, dedicated to Anubis, the jackal-headed god of mummification and the afterlife. But why mummify animals? For many Egyptians, offering an animal mummy to a deity was a way to gain favor or communicate with the divine. It was believed that these mummified animals could act as intermediaries, carrying messages to the gods. Animal mummification was more than a religious practice. It was a reflection of the Egyptian worldview, where animals played crucial roles in the maintenance of the cosmos. This practice illustrates the Egyptians' respect for life in all forms and their belief in a deeply interconnected universe. Through this meticulous and respectful process, the ancient Egyptians sought to ensure eternal life for their cherished animals, bridging the mortal world and the divine. It's a fascinating glimpse into a culture that saw the divine in every aspect of the natural world. The Greek Pharmakos In ancient Greece, the concept of purity and pollution was central to the community's spiritual and social order. When disaster struck, such as famine, disease, or natural calamities, the Greeks sought to cleanse their city-state, or polis, through a ritual known as pharmakos. The term pharmakos literally translates to drug or scapegoat. In this context, it refers to an individual chosen to bear the community's sins and impurities, serving as a human scapegoat. The selection process varied, but often the pharmacos was an outsider or a marginalized individual, sometimes a criminal or a slave. The belief was that such individuals could absorb the city's pollution and, by being expelled or sacrificed, cleanse it. The ritual began with the chosen individual being fed a meal, often figs and barley, symbolizing their role as a vessel for the city's ills. They were adorned with twigs or branches, paraded through the streets amid chants and rituals, allowing the populace to project their sins and impurities onto them. The culmination of the ritual varied. In some versions, the pharmacos was expelled from the city, driven beyond its borders with symbolic gestures of purification. In more extreme cases, they were executed, their death serving as a final purging of the city's accumulated pollution. In some city-states, the pharmacos was led to the boundaries of the city, symbolizing the removal of impurities. This act was often accompanied by rituals meant to transfer the community's accumulated negative energy onto the pharmacos. The individual might be beaten with green twigs, symbolizing the transfer of evils and then banished, carrying the city's ills away with them. In more severe instances, the pharmacos was not just expelled, but executed. This act was believed to offer a more definitive purging of the community's ills. The manner of execution varied, reflecting local customs, 
and the nature of the sins or calamities being atoned for. The execution was often surrounded by complex rituals. Before the act, the pharmacos might be paraded through the city, subjected to mock trials, or involved in symbolic acts of atonement. The execution site, typically outside the city limits, was chosen for its symbolic significance, reinforcing the notion of removing impurities from the community's core. The community actively participated in the pharmacos ritual, not merely as spectators, but as integral components of the act. Their engagement, whether through throwing objects, chanting, or symbolic gestures, was crucial, emphasizing the collective nature of the ritual and the communal transfer of sins. The pharmacos ritual wasn't just about purification, it was a profound social mechanism. By focusing on a single individual or a group, the society reaffirmed its collective identity and cohesion, especially during times of crisis. While the concept of the pharmacos may seem distant, modern societies still engage in forms of scapegoating, though not as literal or brutal. The underlying psychology of projecting blame and seeking collective renewal remains a powerful social dynamic. The pharmacos ritual sheds light on ancient Greek beliefs about purity, sin, and communal responsibility. It reminds us that the way societies deal with crisis, guilt, and purification can take many forms, some of which echo through the ages. The Norse Cedar In the mystical world of the Norse, the cider was a form of sorcery that delved deep into the fabric of fate itself. Unlike the more commonly known Viking warrior ethos, the cider represented a profound and complex aspect of Norse spirituality, often associated with the god Odin and the goddess Freya. Cider involved altering the course of destiny, communicating with spirits, and even journeying into other realms. It was a practice that required deep spiritual and magical knowledge, often seen as existing on the fringes of Norse society. The ceremony itself was an intense, ritualistic process. The cider practitioner, or Ceres, would sit on a high seat or platform, entering a trance-like state through chanting, drumming, and other ritualistic activities. This altered state of consciousness was crucial for the Ceres to travel beyond the physical realm. In this trance, the Ceres could interact with spirits and deities, gain insight into hidden matters, and even influence the threads of fate. Attendees of the ritual, seeking answers or guidance, would pose questions to the Ceres, who, in her visionary state, would provide counsel or foretell future events. Odin, the All-Father, was deeply associated with Cedar, highlighting its importance in Norse culture. He sought the wisdom of Cedar to gain unparalleled knowledge, even at the cost of personal sacrifice. Freya, a goddess of love and fertility, was also intrinsically linked to Cider, embodying its more enigmatic and mystical aspects. Cider practitioners occupied a unique place in Norse society. They were both revered and feared, their abilities seen as both essential and dangerous. The practice of cider blurred the lines between the known and the unknown, the seen and the unseen, the powerful and the perilous. The symbols and runes associated with cider were potent markers of its deep magical essence. These symbols, imbued with mystical power, were not just decorative, but served as tools for focusing and directing the Ceres's journey and spell work. Sati in Hindu tradition. The practice of Sati, also known as Suti, is a historical funeral ritual within some Hindu traditions where a widow would voluntarily or under duress immolate herself on her husband's funeral pyre. This ritual is deeply rooted in complex social, religious, and cultural contexts and has been a subject of significant controversy and misunderstanding, particularly in the perspectives of different cultures and over time. The origins of Sati are not entirely clear, but it is mentioned in ancient texts, suggesting a historical precedent. The practice was never universally applied across all Hindu communities and was more prevalent in certain regions and among specific social classes, particularly within the Rajput community. Sati was intertwined with the concept of ultimate loyalty and devotion. The act was seen as a final demonstration of the widow's fidelity to her deceased husband, ensuring they remained together in the afterlife. It was also believed to confer benefits on the widow, such as salvation and honor, and on her family, including blessings and the purification of sins. The ritual of Sati involved elaborate preparations, where the widow would dress in her finest clothes, 
wear auspicious symbols, and sometimes participate in a procession to the pyre, accompanied by religious chants and hymns. The widow would then climb onto the funeral pyre with her husband's body and set herself alight, often with the assistance of her relatives or priests. In some cases, the practice involved coercion, where the widow was forced to commit the act against her will. The community often played a role in the ritual, witnessing the act as a collective event. It was sometimes perceived as an act of honor, not just for the individual and her family, but for the entire community. Over time, Sati attracted criticism and opposition, both from within India and from external observers. Critics highlighted the coercive aspects of the practice, the suffering it inflicted on women, and its reflection of broader gender inequalities. Sati was formally banned in British India in 1829, with subsequent reinforcement of laws by the Indian government post-independence. The practice is now illegal in India, with efforts to eradicate it involving legal action, social reform, and education. Despite its illegality, isolated incidents of sati have occurred in modern times, sparking national outrage and debate. Viking Blood Eagle The Viking Blood Eagle ritual, as depicted in Norse sagas, stands as one of the most graphic and brutal methods of execution and sacrifice from the Viking Age. Its mention in ancient texts evokes a blend of awe and horror providing a window into the darker aspects of Norse mythology and practices. The Blood Eagle was not a commonplace practice, but reserved for specific circumstances, often as a sacrifice to Odin, the chief god in Norse mythology, or as a punishment for egregious offenses. The ritual's severity underscored the gravity of the victim's crimes or the depth of the sacrificer's devotion. The Blood Eagle had profound, symbolic implications. By invoking such a ritual, the executor not only aimed to inflict pain, but also to achieve a transformation or release of the victim's spirit, possibly sending a message to the gods or fulfilling a perceived cosmic or legal necessity. The ritual began with deep cuts along the victim's back, followed by a gruesome process where the ribs were severed from the spine with precision, requiring a disturbing level of intentionality and focus from the executor. Once the ribs were cut, they were bent backward, resembling the spread wings of an eagle. This act was not merely physical but laden with symbolic meaning, transforming the victim's body into a semblance of the revered bird, which held significant symbolic value in Norse culture. In the most visceral part of the ritual, the lungs were pulled through the openings created by the bent ribs placed on the victim's back, creating an image reminiscent of wings. This act was the culmination of the ritual, marking the victim's final moments and the completion of the sacrificial act. The actual historical occurrence of the Blood Eagle ritual is a subject of debate among historians and scholars. Some argue that the descriptions found in sagas are symbolic or exaggerated, serving more as literary devices or mythologized history rather than accurate historical accounts. The Blood Eagle is mentioned in several Norse sagas, including accounts of the deaths of notable figures like King Aella of Northumbria. These sagas, while providing valuable insights into Norse culture and beliefs, are also recognized for their blend of history, mythology, and storytelling, complicating efforts to discern historical facts. The Blood Eagle ritual, whether historical or mythological, contributed to the fearsome reputation of the Vikings. It symbolized the extreme lengths to which they would go to honor their gods, seek revenge, or uphold their laws. Today, the Blood Eagle remains a potent symbol of Viking ferocity and their complex spiritual world. It continues to captivate the imagination, appearing in modern media and discussions about Viking history and mythology. The Maya Ball Game The game, known as Pits, was more than just a sport. It was a profound ritual that mirrored the cosmic battles of the gods and the forces of the universe. Played across Mesoamerica, this game had deep religious, social, and political implications for the Maya civilization. The ball courts were sacred spaces, often aligned with celestial bodies. These courts were not merely venues for sport, but were considered portals to the underworld, playing a crucial role in Maya cosmology. The game itself was intense and physically demanding. Players used their hips, thighs, and sometimes forearms to propel a heavy rubber ball through a stone hoop positioned high on the court's wall. 
But this was no ordinary game. The stakes were life and death. The ball symbolized the sun's journey through the sky and the underworld, reflecting the eternal struggle between day and night, life and death. The bouncing ball mimicked the sun's rise and fall, embodying the cycle of rebirth and mortality. Rituals surrounded the game, from bloodletting ceremonies to dances and feasts. The players, often nobles or warriors, were not mere athletes, but were seen as intermediaries between the gods and the people, their actions on the court mirroring the celestial battles of deities. The culmination of the game was dramatic. While scholars debate, some suggest that the captain of the losing team, or sometimes the winners, were sacrificed. This was not seen as a punishment, but as an honor, with the sacrificed player joining the gods, ensuring the continuation of the world and the fertility of the land. These sacrifices were elaborate, with the players adorned in ceremonial attire, their blood offered to the gods. This act was a critical communication with the divine, a plea for balance and renewal in the cosmos. The Maya ball game was a spectacle of profound religious significance, a ritual where sport, warfare, and cosmology converged. These rituals, as bizarre or unsettling as they may appear, offer us a window into the human soul and its eternal search for meaning and transcendence. If you've been captivated by these glimpses into the ancient world, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Also, remember to ring the notification bell so you won't miss out on our future journeys into the past. Share your thoughts and any topics you'd like us to explore next in the comments below. We love hearing from you and often draw inspiration from your curiosity.